everybody, Robert Cootie here. Welcome. Today's Friday, Freelance Friday. As always, Freelance Friday. Want to make sure that you guys know we go live at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, as always. And it's currently uh, 10.58 and about 10 seconds after. We'll be going live here very shortly, Marie and I, and where we talk about all things network marketing, good, bad, and yes, even the ugly. We cover subject matter that no one else will dare touch. That's what we do. And if you will, please share our podcast and our social media platforms with our fellow network marketers all across the globe. You can do that by sharing hashtag the MLM solution, hashtag the MLM solution. Also visit our website, the MLM solution.net. We will be streaming live to our YouTube channel and also our Facebook page. So please go there and watch us live. And once again, share these platforms with our fellow network marketers. We appreciate it in advance. and want to say thank you in advance for doing just that. That being said, we will be live here very shortly. I'll talk to you in a minute. Welcome to the MLM Solution Podcast Show, where you'll learn the facts and hear the truth about the network marketing industry. Here's your host, Rob Cootey. Hello, Miss Marie. Hello, hello, hello. How are you today? I am fantastic. It is Friday, after <laughs> all. Do you realize it is the final Friday of January? I know. Every, I know it. I know it's hard to believe the last week of January. The wife and I were talking about that the other day. We were just like, can you believe? She was kind of a little bit down and out about that. Not because January has come to close, just because it's been so chaotic and crazy. Um, it's not the way that we wanted the year to start. <laughs> Needless to say. Well, this is what happens when you're in the midst of moving, right? Everything's just takes on an exponential um slide factor in terms of the time. Everything takes a little bit longer than you thought it would, and there's a lot to do. Yeah, there is. There is. And uh, <clears throat> and then you add the businesses on top of that, where we've been, I've been getting slammed. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, we took a bunch of stuff out yesterday and nailed it all out. And uh, so it's been, it's been hectic, fulfilling those orders and trying to keep, stay on top of the inventory. <laughs> well, hey, a busy business is not a bad thing. It is not a bad thing. It's not. Uh, but at least very little computer time, <laughs> unfortunately, and uh, which forces me to work late into the night, as you can imagine. So uh, with that being said, I'm also shopping for uh, um, more computers because this year we're going to expand. And uh, I told the wife the other day, I'm going to have to hire some people here very shortly. So we're going racing towards, I'm quickly, as much as one person will, because I told her I can't keep doing this by myself. You know, I'm, I should be, you know, I still got my arms issue, arm issue. And that's challenging enough, you know, but then to be prepping to move and, and doing business and then trying to get in front of the computer and, in other words, it's just not enough time in a day for one person to get all that done. Sure. And she's not an entrepreneur per se. In other words, she <clears throat> could care less about business. And we don't work well together, so <laughs> it's not it's not like uh, we can do it or she can help. <laughs> we, well, that's often a, an interesting decision point to make in your business and your life is when to do things yourself and when to outsource them, delegate them to somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. Like I know plenty of people that, well, I'll, I'll use my mother as a great example, okay? Obviously my mother, previous generation, a little bit more old school. 
when Joe and I first got married, actually before we even got married, we had decided to outsource the cleaning of our home mm -hmm. because we both worked a lot of hours. We didn't like things like cleaning kitchens and bathrooms when right. you go through the list of life maintenance chores that you want to do. And we just decided, you know what? Our time's too val valuable. We're going to have somebody else clean our house. Mm -hmm. So for as long as we've been married, with the exception of maybe a few months when we first moved to Utah, yeah. um, we've always had somebody cleaning our house, which, you know, leaves my mother flabbergasted. She's like, <laughs> how can you have somebody else clean your house? It's like, well, you know what? It's really easy. <laughs> And we're not the type of people that go through and clean the house before the house cleaner comes to clean the house because that just defeats the purpose, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it there's there's always a fine line of identifying those things that someone else can do better mm -hmm. where your time is spent in more um, more effective use, better use. Um, more fun use even. I mean, why why do all the things you hate doing? I mean, quite honestly, my my next thing is I would I would love to outsource our food shopping and cooking. That would be my next thing. <laughs> and, well, you know what? There's a lot of people I hear. I don't know about you in your location that are utilizing the uh, um, click whatever they call it. Quick click is that what they call it? Quick click oh, i have no you, idea you shop online you just drive up and they load it into your car yep there there's some of that now well especially that that's one of the things that's really come out of covid right the whole yeah. uh you drive up you load you do your order ahead of time <clears throat> you phone in what time you're going to be there they dump it in your car and and off you go so that's definitely a time saver yeah. there are all sorts of services um i think there's one called blue apron and i don't know what else that's mm -hmm. like meals meals in a box you still prepare them at home but it's like all the ingredients and the instructions are there and you just put it together at home so there's those types of services and there are plenty of services too and i'm sure it varies from you know city to city in different locations where there are actually fruit food preparation services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's lots of options out there because there are plenty of busy people. And when you find something that can solve a problem for other people, you can build a business around it. Yep. So there's plenty of things in the food industry. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, I know people that have used, um, the uh, Blue Apron, and I've known people that use on a regular basis the drive up, you know, the shopping where you just drive up, they load it in the car. And uh, they're having challenges with both. One, uh, Blue Apron is very expensive, and uh, the food can go bad quickly if you don't, uh, you know, eat it within a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. Additionally, uh, the food is not always uh, something that you like. Even if you, you know, go to the catalog and you get something that, you know, oh, that sounds good, that looks good, whatever. So you end up paying uh, a premium price for a product, and then you get it and you taste it, and you're like, man, that really doesn't taste the way. Well, it looked good on the thing. And then on the shopping side of things, <clears throat> when they go up to the grocery, uh, what ends up happening is that. Um, they go home and guess what? There's things missing or they end up with somebody else's stuff. <laughs> and so they're like, uh, this is not, I didn't order this. <laughs> and then they have to go back, obviously, and, and either swap it out. And a lot of times they just try to keep it because once you touch it, um, legally, you're not supposed to be able to use, used. You know what I'm saying? And you can't turn around and sell it again, right? Yeah. So um, seeing some challenges both ways. And I don't know, uh, you know, if there's a real benefit there. To be honest with you, I really don't care one way or the other. Uh, the wife likes doing her own shopping. She does not feel comfortable having somebody else shop for because uh, not only because of the mistakes, but because of the experience. She just likes going out and pushing that cart. <laughs> Well, but even at that, you think about it from a food shopping perspective. My my only hesitancy, like I've never used the order groceries and drive up and load them 
or whatever, because a lot of the stuff that we buy, like the fresh produce, vegetables, fruits, those types of things, I want to pick them out. Yeah. You know, I don't want some 16 year old kid pulling the thing off the front of the rack because <laughs> I know that's not the freshest stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only that, I mean, um, in today's environment, I'm not sure I want somebody else handling my, my uh, food. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I, I'm not as worried about that because everything kind of gets well, let's say, used, but. Let's, well, no, let's say they, they have the virus. They're touching your fruit, they're touching your cans, and then you're taking it home. So, as you know, I'm not paranoid about the virus at all. It doesn't bother me in the least. But there was a survey that came out, I think you and I might have lightly touched on this, came out not long ago in regards to, uh, um, they, they checked grocery stores and they found out that without exception, most of the cashiers were, were younger, obviously. Um, they had the virus, didn't even know they had the virus. And most of the uh, carts had the virus on them. And a lot of the food in the store had the virus on them. And so they were talking, even with the, uh, the plastic screens or the plexiglass screens and all that, they were talking about what a cesspool of, of the virus the groceries were. <laughs> So you add the fact that they're touching all that. I mean, you're going in person. It's going to also happen when they're picking up your food for you. So if they have the virus at you and nobody sees them or they're wiping, their <laughs> they go and pick up your stuff. Um, so I don't know. You know, I'm not, you know me, I'm not a big virus person. So. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm even less so because I look at that and I was like, viruses have been around way longer than 2020 and the coronavirus. Yeah. There are so many viruses. You're yeah. not going to be able to get away from them. And my, my whole thing is just like, you know, hand washing. I don't know why that was such a revelation. We all learned that <laughs> in the garden. Well, the wife and I did that anyway. We were, you know, even before all this, we wiped down the grocery carts because we understand, you know, we use those uh, little, sanitizing um, towelettes, you know, and uh, we'd use three or four of those and we clean our hands at the same time just for that reason. And then we would clean, we've always sanitized. So you're right. This has not been a revelation for us. And <laughs> I'm, I'm all for building up my immune system. I'll get exposed to the viruses. People say, well, I, I have a cold. Don't hug me. I was like, ah, your germs don't scare me, whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's like build up your immune system, good nutrition. I mean, that's really... Yeah. Basis of of everything. And just I, I don't know. I just I can't get into the whole worrying yeah. about those things. Yeah, Some, someday something's going to kill me. And if it's a virus named after a beer, <laughs> so be it. I, <laughs> I, I was talking with somebody the other day. I went and got blood work done and uh, I was saying the same thing and they were just flabbergasted. They could not believe I said that, you know. I said, well, hell, I'm going to die from something. What difference does it make from this virus or something else? <gasps> I mean, you thought I was, I had a gun. <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest with you, man. I, I'd rather, I'd rather not die from the virus because that's like so passe. It's like, yes, nah, yeah. I want something a little bit more exciting, you know, like a, <laughs> yeah. a plane crash. How many people do you know that have died? In not a plane many. Crash? Thank God. <laughs> not many. You know, go go out and blaze the glory. <laughs> Well, she she might have passed, guys, but boy, did she do it right. <laughs> well, here's here's the thing, Rob. I always tell everybody, you know, my uh, when when I die, my celebration of life service. There's going to be a martini and margarita bar, and there's going to be a little contest. We're going to have everybody fill out a form with the story <laughs> of how did Marie die, oh, and whoever comes up with the best story, that's what's going to go in the obituary and go down as the legend. Especially if I do something stupid like die in my sleep. <laughs> how boring is that? Yeah, I totally. I that's a great point. I I like that. I admire that. <clears throat> you know, it's funny you say that because um, it reminds me of dying to something silly. Uh, when I went snow skiing, oh, I can see how you can die on snow skis if you don't. Oh know yeah, with that, <laughs> with that Sonny Bono. Yeah, yeah, and he was a veteran and got and uh, who knows what happened, but obviously he lost control somehow. But uh, 
man, I'll tell you what. Yeah, I've been snow skiing one time. That's all it took. <laughs> That's all it took. And I, I liked it. Don't get me wrong. Oh, my gosh. Miss Marie, I didn't realize you'd go that fast on those things. Oh, yeah. Man, only by the grace of God did I survive. I did it the whole day. I mean, it wasn't like I did it one time. You know, went down the hill one time. Like an idiot, I kept going back up. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't take no intermediate. I went from the top to the bottom. And that was how in the hell I managed to pull that off. First time on skis, I'll never know. <laughs> but, well, I suppose you went in a straight line, too. You didn't think about the, uh, you know. I tried to do some well, that part of it's true. I went down the part where all I had to do is go straight. You're right. <laughs> And well, it did go fast. And I did not know the longer the skis, the faster you go. I did not know that. <laughs> yes, I didn't know that either. Huh? Yes, yes. They said, Are you sure you want these? And I said, Well, yeah. Why wouldn't I? They said, Because these are these are the longest ski we offer, and these are for speed. This is only people that want to go fast. I said, well, okay, that, that works for me because I love speed. You know, <laughs> the shorter ones are for it. I didn't know that. Huh. Boy, ended up being, <laughs> golly, I I have pictures that are somewhere. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, my skis weren't particularly long. They weren't super short either, but I don't know. Even the short skis go pretty darn fast. Pretty darn fast. Um, well, that's what they told me. I'm not saying... That's the only thing I've gone by. I've not verified that. I guess I should have. But you know what? All I know is I went really fast. <laughs> that was good enough for me. That was good enough. Okay, you know what? Life life is filled with inherent risk. There, I don't think there is anything you can do where you can't potentially suffer a fatality. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Doing it because you yeah. just never know. Nope. I mean, you can be sitting at home in your recliner. I don't know how many stories I've read about this. You know, people sitting at home in their recliner watching TV and a plane crashes into their house. <laughs> well, you have absolutely no control over that whatsoever. You're absolutely right. You know what? It's funny you say that because I've read, we've had it here locally. Maybe you have too. Where um, a tree fell on the house and killed the person. <laughs> yeah. And then we got a huge tree out back. I mean, if that thing comes down, we're in big trouble. <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. Our houses are so close. I won't say there's zero lot line. These houses were built in the 50s. And uh, the, the yards are moderate, I guess you would say. But the point is, the tree is like 80 foot tall and it's massive. Mm. And if it comes down, and we have a bunch of those right here. A lot of people have cut them down over the last five years. Uh, we've had a couple over 100 feet. I mean, you could see them for a long way off, and they cut them down. Because, you know, once they get to be 60, 70, 80 years old, they can start getting hollow on the inside, <clears throat> and you can't see them. And one of the telltale signs of it uh, getting unhealthy is when the larger branches start to snap off during wind storms or ice storms or whatever. Uh, if one happens, that's no big deal. But if you start having them, and some of these branches come down, Miss Maria, or a tree unto themselves. And uh, so they do real damage when they come down. Um, <clears throat> we've had some homes here during wind storms and ice storms and stuff like that, like I said, over the last five years, that literally uh, made the news because the, the trees went right through the home. And uh, I think I have pictures of that somewhere too. But anyway, the point is, uh, who would have thought? You're, you know, you're in bed, you're sleeping <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden this tree comes flying through your house. Well, uh, unfortunately the tree we have in the backyard, no matter what direction it goes in, because it's so tall and we're all so close together, somebody's going down. <laughs> well, that, that'd be a different way of dying in your sleep is having a tree fall on you. Actually, one of the most bizarre stories I ever read, this was years ago, happened in Wisconsin a woman was canoeing on a river and a beaver whatever was gnawing on a tree on the shoreline. Oh my gosh. And just as she is passing <clears throat> down the river in her canoe, this um, tree toppled and falls right on top of her. What are the odds? That is a crazy story. That, yeah. I, I remember reading that article and I was like, what are the odds?
Oh, yes. you know? And does her death certificate say she was killed by a beaver? That's what I want. <laughs> well, yours would, because <laughs> you'd made sure. By golly, you make sure that says beaver. Well, but, you know, you know, the deadliest animal is no. a deer. It's what? A deer. Get deer on. are the deadliest animals to humans because so many cars hit deer. Oh. And what well, happens yeah. when you stop a car? When you brake hard, the back end of your car lifts up. That means the front end dips and it goes under the deer. It'll take the legs out from the deer and the deer comes right through the windshield, kills oh. more drivers than any other animal. I did not know that. Yeah. Huh. So all those, all those people that, you know, wag their finger at the Bambi hunters, hey, those those are some deadly deer. you got to watch out. You know, I look, I'm not much on hunting. Now, <clears throat> if it ever gets to where we have to survive <laughs> on me going out and hunt, I will do it. <laughs> Make no mistake. But <clears throat> outside of that, I'm not much on hunting, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not an anti-hunter. I grew up in the country, so it's not like I'm not capable or not wanting or whatever. It's just that I have no need, right? <clears throat> but I will say that uh, if it came down to it, I would be hunting me a deer. <laughs> <clears throat> but I did not know that they were the number one cause of death to humans. Well, in the animal. animal kingdom, I mean, yeah, if you think about it, every, everybody's afraid of sharks, but... Oh, I could definitely see an alligator shark, yeah. It's, uh, it's the deer you got to watch out for. <laughs> I love deer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny. I remember we used to go hunting... <clears throat> And when I was just telling the wife, because during the winter, there's certain times where um, I, I flash back to me and my dad and them out hunting, as you can imagine, because of the weather and the setting, right? And so uh, it brings about memories. And I remember I, <laughs> when we would run up on something, whether it was squirrel, rabbit, deer, whatever, we were hunting, uh, I would miss on purpose. And my dad, <laughs> I think he... He got very for he was a very quiet guy. And I think he quit asking me to come because he either figured it out or he's like, this kid sucks at hunting. <laughs> he never hits anything. Can't <laughs> hit the broad I'm, side of a barn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, can you hit that barn over there, son? <laughs> no, Dad. <laughs> but he he quit asking me to go. But I would go with him because I enjoyed, you know, I'd be home on leave and I enjoyed going out there with them, you know, and uh, I just didn't have the heart to kill something and just for the fun of it. But I mean, they ate it. They didn't do it for fun of it. They, um, without getting off topic too much, I remember when I would come home and, and they would get the rabbits and the squirrels and all that. And they come home and skin them and the women would cook them. The, the guys had to skin them, you know, and, and get the pellets out and all that. And, uh, it was, I did that part, you know, uh, and the, it was actually quite tasty. I, I, have you ever eaten squirrel? It's got that I wild. I can't say that I have. It's got that wild, uh, more so than rabbit, that wild uh, animal type taste. I don't, it's kind of tangy. Anybody that's eaten squirrel understands or some other animal that has that little bit of tanginess. And I called it uh, wildness, you know, living in the wild. I don't know what what you call it. But anyway, uh, that was that was interesting how the meat tasted so different and stuff. But we actually did, in fact, eat it that day. We go out like three or four in the morning, and uh, for the deer. And then as the day moved along, the squirrel and rabbit would come out, and we go ahead and do that too. And we had our own. My dad had probably I think close to two hundred acres or something like that. I can't remember the exact number. There was a dispute over just how big it was. But the point is, we go out to his farm so we could shoot whatever we wanted. <laughs> you know? and nobody was out there, believe me. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, what was I going to say? Um, but I remember, I remember um, <clears throat> oh, I know what it's talking about, the weather. So every time the weather from this point on, you know, in my life or that point on, even this year, some of the weather was out there. I'd go out there in the coldness, and you have the all the grass. The grass is dead, of course, and 
you know, we'd go out there and some of the grass would be frozen over with ice and stuff and you'd be crunching along. So when I have those moments, I'm flashback and it uh, gives me a warm, fuzzy feel. Think about my dad and those moments. Do you have moments like that where you can flash back to your childhood or something? Oh, yeah. I I mean, deer deer hunting was a big thing in Wisconsin. So I remember oh, growing up. Yeah. We, uh, we grew up in the city, but my folks had friends who lived up north, right? So they actually had a farm up north and a lot of land. And we'd always go up there for uh, for the opening of deer hunting. And the guys would go out early in the morning. And us as kids, we'd run around the farm and play in the barn and find the barn cats and all those types of things. But my my favorite one was uh, one year we went up to to go deer hunting and like the month before, uh, the guy that owned the farm had been elk hunting out in Colorado. Oh yeah, so he had gotten one, and he got the rack off the elk, so he just had this big set of horns from the elk. Well, the guys went out hunting their first uh, their first day opening day. And they got a deer, but it was just like, it was like a four point buck, right? It wasn't anything impressive. Um, and they always hung it in the tree in the front yard. They lived on this two lane highway. So quite a bit of traffic would go by. And they always liked to display what they caught, you know, by hanging it in the tree. But it was just this little four point buck. It wasn't that impressive. So one of the guys got the bright idea. He goes out there and he takes this elk rack and he wires it to the head of the deer. So if you can imagine oh. Oh. a little white-tailed deer, I mean, not that it was little, but still in comparison, wired this elk rack to this deer. So the rack of horns is almost as long as the deer's body. Yes. Hanging in the tree, visible from the street. So it was just like every now and then it was like, you'd hear this and the cars would pull up the driveway because they wanted to see that it was an impressive rack on this deer, right? And oh my God. One guy, one guy pulls up into the driveway, he gets out of his car, he starts walking up to it and he realizes what it is, that it's this <laughs> elk rack wired to the deer. Oh my gosh. And he just he just like looks at it and he he <laughs> tosses his arm, shakes his head, turns around, drives away. It was it was the funniest thing. I mean if <laughs> It was about every five minutes you were hearing. <laughs> People were stopping oh, I see that. Yeah. to see this huge rack on this deer. So I could see that. That's pretty funny to be honest. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. Yeah, the guys sat sat in the house playing cards and whatever all afternoon, just laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see that laughing. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, we. Uh, I'll never forget one night in Mississippi. We were driving down this road. Of course, there was a lot of small two-lane roads in Mississippi, <clears throat> and it was Mississippi's full of pine trees, huge pine trees. Anyway, uh, we go down this one desolate road. I don't know why. I think we were going to visit somebody, but it was late at night, <clears throat> and uh, I turned the I turned right onto this road, and I didn't get a hundred feet down that road, and all of a sudden we look up, and there was this deer. And it had to be the biggest deer I have ever seen. I, I, I don't even know how to. Um, I don't know how to describe it. It took up half the road, and the rack on it was the biggest I had ever seen. And it was huge. We were driving a little Honda Civic back in those days, a little four door Honda Civic, and uh, it dwarfed. I did not know deer got that big, and it, that antlers got that big. It wasn't a moose. I know a moose and uh, being in Montana and North Dakota and all that. But uh, that thing was huge. We just sat there. It was me, the wife and the kids. And we all just sat there just staring at it. Totally dumbfounded that. I mean, here, you don't have a gun. Guys dream of running into something like this. And uh, I don't even know how to describe the size of it. I'm at a loss, but it was it was unbelievable. Um, I was overwhelmed, really, to be honest with you. And another deer story, I remember when we went to Yosemite, and for all of you that may not know what that is, it's Yosemite. <laughs> but we, uh, the wife and all of us, <clears throat> we were always on the go, visiting this and that. And uh, we were in the valley floor, not far from Half Dome. And uh, we were down the valley floor, which is absolutely stunning. That whole place is just amazing. So we were down there, and we were driving by 
<clears throat> it was all flat in the valley, of course. And off in the distance were the, were the uh, pack of deer. And uh, it was moms and, and uh, babies, too. And we got out and we went over and fed those things and pet those things. They were used to humans. I have never, I'll never forget that. How they let us come up to them. And uh, <clears throat> we had some corn and stuff and we sat there and held it in our hand. And they came right up to us and with the babies and everything. Hmm. And uh, we pet them. I, it was, I'll never, never forget that. It was an amazing thing. Um, of course, they were used to humans. I mean, it wasn't like a wild deer is going to, it was obvious they were used to it. Uh, but still, that was amazing. And uh, I'll never forget the elk. We had a, oh, speaking of that, <clears throat> we had a family member who traveled through Wyoming, Montana. I mean, he would be gone for weeks, six, seven weeks at a time. We ate elk. Oh, my gosh. That is unbelievably good. Could not freaking believe it. It is so tender and so tasty. It's amazing that people don't have that on their plate daily. I was totally amazed at how good that elk meat was. Elk meat was. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually prefer elk to venison deer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, yes. It's it's less it's less gamey, I think. Yeah, gamey. There's the word. Yeah. I said wow, but gamey. There it is. Man, look at you. <laughs> More versed in the in the nature of things than me, but um, I think we all have stories like that. I, I remember petting my first dolphin; that was freaking amazing. And looking into the eyes of the dolphin, oh my gosh, it was almost human like. Hmm. You ever done that? I have not. They say dolphin are some of the most uh, intelligent creatures out there. So they say that. well, I, I could see the potential in that because I sat there and, and it kept. It came up to me, and it, I mean, it was almost like it was talking to you. Mm. And I looked it right in the eye, and it would look at me, and it would come up and right next to me, and just kind of brush up against me. And I'd reach out and pet it. And I can't even describe the the skin, how you how it feels. Um, it's a uh, wow. I don't I don't even know what to say. If you ever get the chance, do it. But man, you look in their eye and it, it's like they're talking to you. It was it was spooky, eerie and fun all at the same time. I'll never forget that. And uh, the other time we were next to a school of dolphins and I mean hundreds, probably three or four hundred. <clears throat> and we were they were right next to the boat and they'd follow the boat. They just get the biggest kick out of that for whatever reason. I don't know. And uh, you had the babies and the moms and the babies were in the middle. You know, the parents or the adults, I should say, were all around with the babies in the middle to protect the babies, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, to see them playing and having fun and keeping up with that boat was amazing. <clears throat> but that, I guess that's how they got their exercise and stuff. But you, they would look at you while you were on the boat, too. So that was amazing. Yeah. Now, what I didn't see was a whale. I saw walruses hanging out on those buoys out in the ocean, you know, they get up there to sun. Did you know that? Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> those can be kind of fun to watch. <laughs> yes. 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 They're huge. Man, they're they big. <laughs> yeah. Seals. Those are larger than I expected. Walrus. They're even bigger. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been around the seals too in, in nature. They're playful and pretty intelligent themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you have the SEALs in the military. They're pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hung around with those. I, I will I will disagree with that. <laughs> Certainly. They are very smart. Yeah, so, so welcome to the wildlife episode of Freelance Friday yeah. today. <laughs> I don't know how we've gone off on this. Day. I was thinking the exact same thing, man. We, we did nothing but talk wildlife that whole time. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Navy SEALs are special into themselves. I'll say that as we close. Um, but the, the, whether you want to admit it or not, they're, they're trained killing machines. That's what they are. That's what they do. That's their whole purpose. <clears throat> and um, the training that they go through is just over the top. Uh, they are experts in munitions. They're experts in explosives. They're experts in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
Uh, they're experts in uh, night uh, attacks. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, well, and, and you have to be impressed by those people who are willing to go through that training, mm -hmm. that intensity, and do those things that for most of us are unthinkable um, in order to protect us, right? Um, Yes. So I, uh, you know, my hats off to them. Grateful for all of them, all of the folks that serve in law enforcement, the military, yes. the yes. fire department. <clears throat> I mean, all those, all those types of service industries that really make this society go and and protect us. So I you know, agree amazing, more. amazing people out there. Absolutely. <clears throat> and you know what, Miss Marine? Here's the thing: as we close. Without those, if you take all those away, you have chaos. Yeah. You do. I mean, think about it. If you didn't have a fire department, what would you have? Fires. Yeah. <laughs> and a bunch of them. Yeah. And uh, so I'm very grateful for each and every one of those. And, and I tell them when I'm out and about and I see them, I'll go up and shake their hand. I'll say, hey, I just want to say thank you, you know, because I appreciate what those guys do. I just cannot imagine our lives without them. So if you guys see them, please do the same. They deserve all the kudos we can give them. Would you not agree? Oh, absolutely. And and if you think about it, they, on the pay scale of earnings, I mean, oh, they're, gosh. they're in the realm of teachers, right? They are some of the yes. most impactful members of society yes. and not as well paid as they should be. In I life. would agree with that, boy. Uh, we have a bunch of friends that are teachers and what they go through. Sorry, I had to write something down real quick before I forgot it. <laughs> I didn't mean to. But, yeah, to see what they go through, <clears throat> man, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But you know what? They do have an impact. I will say that. I mean, the wife and I have firsthand knowledge. We're right there with them in certain cases. We've mentored kids at school. We do volunteer work uh, at schools. And we see firsthand the impact, the positive impact they can have on some of these kids. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Yeah. All righty, Miss Marie. With that being said, what are we doing on uh, Monday, Monday, Monday? On Monday, you know how we like to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're one of the <laughs> few uh, teams that actually address the uglies in the network marketing industry. Monday, we're touching on a big one attrition. Oh. So join us for yeah. that. We're going to talk about the reality of attrition in your business, how to prepare for well, it. There we go. With it. There it is. Very, now, now, now very tomorrow's subject, but It's Monday's subject, guys. It's yeah. Monday. <laughs> Monday, tomorrow. Yeah, um. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you have a good weekend, Miss Marie. Let me close this out uh, properly here, guys. Please share, like, and comment on the various social media platforms. If you go to a YouTube channel, please hit the bell twice. When you do, you get notification when we go live, as well as when we are uploading content. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then hit the share buttons. View our videos. We have a lot of great videos there with a lot of great subject matter. Become an expert in this business model. And if you do, I'm telling you, this is going to be a whole lot easier for you. And you can do that just going to our videos. So when you do, please hit the thumbs up when you like what you're uh, viewing and hearing. And when you're on the YouTube or on our live podcast as well, please hit the thumbs up. We always appreciate it when you do. And if you will, go to our website, dmlmsolution.net, and you can find us on any of our social media platforms by utilizing hashtag dmlmsolution. That way you don't miss an episode of what we cover. And as well, you can have your own classroom to at your fingertips 24-7. How can you beat that? You cannot. And as you know, we have our free gifts on our website, free, 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 free. I always say F-R-E-E, -E, free. These are free gifts. They're going to be changing here very shortly. I encourage you to go there now and get them. All you have to do is visit the MLMSolution.net, and you will be able to download those immediately, one video, one audio, and one ebook. The ebooks are written in a short, concise, and informative manner. It's not going to take you long to read them. The audio and video, take that uh, knowledge level in the ebook even to a higher level, uh, use, utilizing our personal experiences in this industry. 
So with that, the four critical mistakes that most network marketers make, and yes, they do, and any one of those four or all four of those will eat away at the success you're trying to build. Don't let that happen to you. Become informed, use that knowledge to avoid those four critical mistakes. And then you have, this is your peanut butter, and then the jelly that goes with that peanut butter is our five simple steps to networking success. And the bread that brings that all together is the zero to networking hero. And there's a shot of the five simple steps right there. This flyer, <coughs> which you can download. <coughs> I am so sorry, guys. On our website, and you can get this right there. Look at the form of the short to the point, very concise, tells you exactly what we're about, right, Miss Marie? You couldn't have a better flyer to tell you exactly. And look, it outlines it. If you got nothing else from us but this free uh, flyer, you have the steps right there outlined for you. <laughs> right, Miss Marie? You can go out and find a way to develop your own leads. You can deliver your own message. You can do your own 90 day mini blast. You can identify and work with your own leaders and then do step five all over again. <coughs> you don't need us. <laughs> there it is, right there in all its glory. All right, Miss Marie? <laughs> well, I don't know that they don't need us, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a the scale of ambition. Well, you know what, Miss Marie? If they do that, they're going to find out they're going to need us. All right. So, so uh, scale of ambition, we talk about all the time. There it is. Look at there. Look how cute that cover is. Well, the cuteness on the outside hides the um, imperative information on the inside. Guys, you need to know what the scale of ambition is about and how it applies to the business building process and why you need to use it. Right, Miss Marie? Wouldn't you agree? Uh, I agree. The scale of ambition is important to know. You need to know who you're targeting and why. That's right. The numbers of network marketing, we talk about it all the time. Guys, if you don't know the numbers, this is one of the most important things we offer. We offer a lot of great information, but this is one of the most important without being uh, any, having any overhype here at this moment. This book is the most important book, one of the most important books we offer because of the fact if you don't know the numbers, they're going to work against you. If you're going to learn anything, learn the numbers and how they work. Okay. The numbers do their thing each and every second of each and every day, regardless of whether you acknowledge their existence or not. Uh, the bottom line is, is that they're going to do what they do. And if you understand them and utilize them and work with them, the power that they can have on your business can be immense. OK, especially in the compounding of the success that you're having. So you definitely want to have that. And the threshold of profitability guess what? The threshold of profitability means exactly what it says. There's a threshold number that directly affects your profitability. Do you want to make money from day one all the way to the last step you take? Well, sure you do. Do you want to maximize the financial opportunity and leave no money on the table and with, with the company that you're with? Well, sure you do. Well, guess what? You better understand the threshold of profitability and use it because the threshold of profitability works directly with this right here because the threshold of profitability is a number and the numbers are part of the numbers of network marketing. So we bring that up so that you understand that. With that being said, Ms. Marie, do you have anything else to say? Nope. Look forward to joining us Monday. It's going to be February 1st. We're heading into February oh next gosh. week already. 11 a.m. Eastern time. Join us as we talk about attrition. Very important topic. You want to understand how to deal with that because it happens to the best of us. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it can be demoralizing if you're not prepared for it. All right, guys, with that being said, we're going to hop off here Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please share our podcast with our fellow network marketers all across the globe. Please let them know that we go live each and every day, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, each and every day. We depend on you helping us get the word out. Please do that, and thanks in advance for doing it. All right, guys, with that being said, we're going to hop off here. God bless. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday. Thank you for listening to the MLM Solution Podcast. For more info, visit our website, themlmsolution.net. Please follow us on the following platforms, Facebook, YouTube, etc. And share this podcast with our fellow network marketers around the world by hitting the share button on our various platforms.